All right. Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to another Learning Tech Talks, where we are continually exploring the landscape of learning tech while cutting through the fluff. Today, I am rejoined by Mikhail Warnu, and uh, we were just talking about the cool two dots he has in his name, so I'm, I'm trying to make sure I, I pronounced it right, which he confirmed that I did. So he's back. He is back on the show, and we're going to be talking about a lot of things related to skills and digging into skill taxonomies, skill inference, real practical use cases on how are people using skills. And it was a year ago, we talked about this right before we went live. It's been a year since you've been here and a lot has happened since then. Is that fair to say? A lot has happened. So uh, I'm, I hope I can share all everything that happened, but good to be back for since. Everything. We're going to get through everything. A year's worth of updates. <laughs> literally like everything <laughs> we're gonna be here till four in the morning uh, yes exactly <laughs> something it's like 5 p.m uh now in uh in europe and belgium where i'm from so people listening back home are probably like using this to get ready for the weekend i can imagine that's they, right uh, they do. well what better way to get ready for the weekend right. than to define skill taxonomies and prepare, prepare for what you can do with skill exactly. like i like it i like it now we're gonna have a good conversation and you know it's funny that a lot's happened in that year we were even just talking about the fact that a year ago we probably were talking about won't it be nice that in a year we'll be done with covid <laughs> and here yeah. we are so <laughs> but it's all good all good so we're gonna get into that but while we're getting ready to dive into the conversation we were talking about this as well. So this is going to be an interesting question. And those of you watching or, or listening, be sure to add in your, your responses in the comments. But you're working from anywhere. So, Mikhail, where are you working from today? I'm working from anywhere. More specifically, I'm in Gran Canaria. So it's an island uh, next to the coast of Africa. It's really nice weather here. And uh, I would recommend everybody to work from anywhere, specifically here. So... Uh, Okay. Yeah. So if you're going to work from anywhere, work from yes. there cuz the weather is beautiful. You said you said back home it's it's gray and and kind of the weather's crummy, so it's been a nice break. Yeah. Exactly. The weather is actually depressing and just getting some sunlight here it's, uh, it's been amazing. Okay. All right. All right. And you're you've been there for a week, you're going back home tomorrow, is that correct? Yeah, going back home tomorrow quite early, so uh it's going to be an early night for me as well and then uh Okay. Tomorrow. It's, uh, so, to yeah. <laughs> so we'll wrap this learning tech talks at, at, you know, three in the morning, you'll get a couple hours of sleep, just get back exactly. on a plane and then go. That's, exactly. that's the plan. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm where I always am in Milwaukee. I don't have a cool, I don't have a cool story related to that one, but let's shift gears. Cause you said I was going to like your answer to our icebreaker question. So I'm really interested to see where it goes with this. So what is your interesting job that was completely unrelated to what you do today? Yeah, and, it's, and it is really uh, unrelated. So I, I used to be a lifeguard, uh, at, a lifeguard. Uh, at the coast in, uh, in Belgium. Yeah, I even saved people. So uh, it, it is maybe a little bit related because I'm still saving people, of course. Uh, right, and, uh, still doing that. So that skill is transferable, but okay. And where were you a lifeguard though? Like at a, like just like a community pool at like a cool water park? I mean, what's, no, it was what's at, the, at the beach actually? It was a, a beach at the beach. For surfing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were like, okay. "You're tall. You can uh, you can be where the surfers are at." You can see them. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That was, okay. Uh, it was fun. All right. It was fun though. It's uh, were long days, uh, and sometimes it was uh, quite gruesome, especially because at the the regular beaches. Uh, People don't come when it's storming or the weather is bad. It's the other way okay. around when uh, or with surfers. Like if you have a lot of wind, they're coming out. If it's raining, oh. they're definitely coming out for some reason. So it was uh, it was quite the thing. So I did that over. So it's not the it's in. not the glory days like a lot of people imagine, where every day is beautiful and you're just sitting, you know, soaking in the rays, hanging out on your it chair. Reading watch. A book. It wasn't day watch. It's. Uh... <laughs> Not at all. Actually. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. And so, so random related question to that one then is, were you, are you into swim? Like, were you a really good swimmer? Like, I mean, cause obviously if you're saving people in rough, I mean, this isn't the community pool where you're not dealing with anything other than just obnoxious kids. So are you, are you a pretty solid swimmer then? Or were you at the time? I used to be, but the, the trainings were like, they were not fun. They were really okay. early every time, so I kind of lo lost my love for swimming while becoming a okay. lifeguard. And then when I was uh, when I was there, it was just the mandatory trainings I did, and I kind of stopped swimming. 
especially okay. uh, especially when I like got into units. So, yeah, I lost my love right. for swimming. Maybe it was there at some point, but uh, right now it's like a few a few hundred meters, and that's it. So no. Okay, and I'm assuming your trainings weren't e-learning modules either. <laughs> no, sadly not. It was, it was sw swimming with clothes on, uh, okay. and then swimming with 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 terrible or in terrible weather conditions. Uh, a lot of running and running in sand is terrible, and they really like to let you run in sand. Running in sand reason. is awful. Yeah, running in sand, it's, it yeah, is. it's hard on your feet too. Okay, all right. Well, that makes sense. And and the lesson for everybody learning is, you can actually train people to hate something that they once loved. We can we can now take that from that. Exactly. L and D <laughs> people warning: if we overtrain people or push them too hard, something they dearly love, they may say, "You know what? I I just can't handle this anymore. I quit." <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Ain't that the truth? That's okay. uh, okay. All right. Well, mine mine is I actually uh, and I actually had a community conversation on this in the community this week. So I used to build golf courses. I worked on a construction crew, and I traveled oh. around the U.S and built golf courses. So I used to drive the heavy equipment, you know, carved out greens with bulldozers, all sorts of stuff. So I learned, I learned a ton from doing that. I don't apply much of it from my home office anymore, but if I ever, you know, get a piece of equipment, maybe I'll do something fun. I can still run a skid steer, that kind of stuff. So nothing that exciting, but it was super fun. Got to know tons of people, not something everybody's done is saying, Built golf courses, so definitely not. But go. so not a lot of transferable skills on your end, then. <sighs> you know that was that was one of the follow up questions, though. When I when I had this discussion, was what was something you learned from it? And the thing with it is, in construction, the crews are it's it's a really diverse group of people. You know, just you come together quick, and you're from all different backgrounds, and you had to learn how to get to know people really quickly, especially people that maybe on the surface, you'd be like, we don't really have anything in common. And actually that was really helpful. I learned a couple languages, um, got to know folks. So I still do use that, but um, not much of my heavy equipment or you know, how to carve the fairway of a, of a <laughs> PGA course. I don't use that really anymore. <laughs> anyway, okay, go for it. Yeah, what I learned uh, when I was last lifeguard was how easy it is to just not be attentive you have to pay attention okay. the entire time uh and okay. it was especially in the beginning you, you're distracted all the time and you have to essentially keep your eyes on the water you have to know okay you have to know who's in the water essentially you have to count them as well if you really want to be good at your job so when you okay. know like okay people are coming in and out or the the number suddenly dropped by two that should like uh, ring a bell and say hmm, maybe uh maybe maybe i should go and uh, go and take a look but in the beginning, it was so hard to, to be attentive all the time. So uh, it was uh, it was some good training, and also just on the meta level, you you learned a lot about your own perception and, and how easily uh, or how easy it was to be distracted. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, and you know what's funny about that, and I know we're, we'll we'll shift gears because otherwise we'll be here till four in the morning. But um, it, it is the fact I've I've had a few friends who are lifeguards, and there is this impression that you're just sitting you know, kind of reading a book or, or looking at your, but actually it's not, you have to be watching everything that's going on. Cause the other thing you tell me if this is true or not, but I remember one friend said people who are drowning, it's not like in the movies where there's this big splashing and their arms are flying around and you're like, Oh, that person's drowning. I mean, it, they're like, it's actually this quiet. All of a sudden you notice somebody just isn't moving or whatever. And you have to be really attentive to it. Exactly. It's exactly like that. And that, 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 that's why I mentioned counting. So you count the people that are in the water because that's essentially the only way to know if someone has been under for a while. And then when you, okay. when you, when you notice that you go in the water or at least you, you call the people on the boat and then, uh, and then they, they go have a look, but that, that's the problem. It's like, you don't see when somebody is drowning, they just start sinking. And that's, uh, that's, yeah. that's really tricky, especially in the beginning. Okay. All right. And I don't know that an AI skills taxonomy will help with that one though. I don't think so. Maybe we'll Not find yet. we'll find out. We'll find out. We'll see if that's one of the use cases that comes up Thank in you. the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned, everybody. Um, okay, but let's do one a quick overview for folks because we did go live a year ago, and you were much earlier stage than you are now, and have made some huge progress in, since then. But for folks who may be thinking tech wolf, we're talking skills. What what is it? What is kind of your elevator pitch of what is it that TechWolf does? Yeah, great. So first, I'll let me introduce myself for people who don't know me. 
I am Michael, That's I'm true. background in computer science uh, and AI, the three founders of TechWolf did or do. Uh, we started the company with the three of us and we grow from three to 25 people over the last three years. So quite some, uh, quite some tremendous growth, signed some big names uh, over, the, over the last few years. And essentially what we're seeing is that many organizations are making the shift from job titles to skills. Because a job title yep. isn't the, the correct level of analysis to, to do talent management. A software engineer is called a software engineer at TechWolf, but also at an automotive parts company. So it doesn't really yeah. tell you uh, what, what someone is doing. So No, it doesn't. Exactly. We see organizations shifting from job title to skills because it's a better way to understand people and their capabilities, one job title or 25 skills. And it's also a better way to understand the change. And Gartner saw that the skills for the same job title or for the same job description are changing by 25% year over year. So okay. essentially in five years, you have 20% left. So it's not the same job. So really that skills uh, piece uh, and that skill-based organization is becoming ever more relevant, but people are really bad at self-assessing their skills. Uh, everybody thinks they're a, a better driver than average. Uh, you even have uh, prisoners that, that rate themselves higher in, in kindness and morality than, than the people that, that aren't incarcerated. So yeah. manual input really doesn't work. Uh, we had customers where they had a, a, an entire skills management pro, uh, program. Only 20% of people regularly updated uh, their skills. So that's, that's broken. People can do it, they don't update it. And that's why we built artificial intelligence to look at different data sources, HR data sources. So think career history, learning history, and HR data yeah. sources like the projects you work on uh, and translate that to skills and, and use that skills data to solve some uh, some of the use cases we'll get into. So that's the okay. kind of long elevator pitch. Well, that? no, I you know, and I think th this will set the table for some of this stuff that we're about to talk about because it is important. I've had a few people ask, you know, what what's the conversation topic this week and and I've described it similar to what you've said because this is a really important conversation that's coming up. I mean, every skills every report I see in the trends, every HR trends and and report that comes out is talking about this shift you referenced, which is this movement from job titles to skills, because it is really important. And, and some of that's not new in the sense, the example you used, a software engineer at Ford Motor Company versus Microsoft are two very different skill sets. And I think there's always been this understanding that, yeah, we recognize there's that difference, but we didn't really know what to do about it. And so we'd write different job descriptions and things like that. But it made it very hard even for the candidate to know that piece. And then the self-assessment's another complexity, which we'll dig into more there. But I think what you're talking about, I commented on a post this week about it, is being able to actually get that information is not easy for folks. And I, and I continue to see in conversations that I have that that's probably one of people's biggest things. They're trying to pull it maybe from Workday. I had one company I was talking to that they set up a skills portal, like you talked about. Everybody go fill out your self-assessment. It did not work very well because one, you couldn't get people to do it. Two, it just didn't stay current. And three, that, that cognitive dissonance of you know what I'm really great at? This. And it's like, I don't think you're actually very great at that, but you clearly think, I mean, there's a lot of challenges with that. And you're you're pulling that together from a multitude of data sources. Exactly. And it's not just the HR sources. It gives you some context. Yeah. Uh, but essentially, the systems where you apply and demonstrate skills are not HR systems for sales. It might be Zoom and Salesforce for marketing. It's project management yeah. tools. It's, it's Teams for developers. It's Git. It's Jira, it's Slack. So it's really combining those. I, I don't know if you ever ever saw a 3D movie. You have like the two the two, uh, the yep. two glasses, you have the red glass and blue glass. You need both lenses. So let's say the the baseline core HR data, the data from your employee record, it, it sets the context. Uh, what, what's your education? What's your history? And that what you work on like um, instantiates that, that context, gives you additional, more granular information. And you need the two pieces of the puzzle to actually understand what people are capable of. And then that, that's when you really unlock the value of a, of a skill-based organization. Okay. Well, and, and the point about, I think that's a huge takeaway for folks who may be you know digging into this space. Because I would say on the, not maturity in terms of immature, mature, but more on the maturity curve of where you are in the process, I think a lot of folks are still early stage in this. They recognize it's a gap. They recognize there's something they need to do about it. And they're figuring out, so what do we do about it? But that understanding that, 
if you're trying to tackle this skills problem and all you're looking at is the data you have in HR, that is a miss. I mean, that is a big miss in terms of actually capturing that whole picture of the person because the reality is our systems only, that is one lens and one lens is not a complete lens when you're looking at something as complex as a person's skills. Exactly, exactly. It's just that, and that's also what we see. Uh, it's by combining the two that you get the you get the full picture. Uh, and then when you talk to people in the business, I've had so many people just tell me, like, I never update Word. They almost like what <laughs> they're almost proud of it. Like, I never opened that thing, or I never opened the code. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's true, and then. No, it is. It is. And then you think about the fact that the the half-life of skills is going like this. And then people go, oh, I haven't been in Workday and updated that for two years. When most skills are basically obsolete in a few years. Well, then essentially what you're saying is anything we do have is probably either completely obsolete or it's at least grossly, grossly out of date. Exactly. And people... You know, like they're bad at self-assessment, but they also like yeah. there isn't really an incentive to keep this up to date. Uh, no. And many organizations come to us and say, like, look, we tried skill management, and the problem is we now have multiple platforms requiring our employees to complete skills data. On one hand, on the other hand, they're saying we want a consumer-grade employee experience. Like those two do not match. Uh, no. and then Asking somebody to input all this information and self-assess five times in five different systems that don't talk to each other is not a, that's not a consumer grade experience at all. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And then when you think about it, like having that information unlocks so much value. Like our CEO yeah. always says like 80% of mar market cap is intangible value right now. And a large okay. chunk of that, that intangible value is human capital. So right now that's accounted for as an expense, partly because it's really hard to have a comprehensive in inventory of human capital, like to actually quantify human capital. And for us, that's what a skill inventory is. And that's also like the, the power uh, skills unleash. And that's also what we see once our customers start looking at it like that. Like they, they start talking about using skills for performance management and using skills to objectify performance management, using skills to, and this is an interesting one for you, using skills to measure the ROI uh, of learning, uh, using skills yep. to solve internal mobility, but not in a traditional sense, because let's say if you implement the talent marketplace, it really takes you 18 months until that is set up and you actually yeah. drive internal mobility. But what if you have a problem right now? And yeah. as soon as you have inventory, all these problems well, can be solved by, by, by skills, data, at least partly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and as we get into some of these cases where, you know, people may be saying, hey, we want to do something with this, but we're not exactly sure what we're, we'll unpack some of these. But one of the things I want to get to first is your definition on this one, because this is a term that's being thrown around a lot right now, which is skill taxonomy. And you see it in the vendor space. There's a lot of platforms that are saying we we have our own skill taxonomy type of a thing. You hear people trying to map out their skill taxonomy, which is what's happening with this. Well, we're trying to gather this skill data so we can build our own skill taxonomy. And I will tell you, in conversations I have, people's understanding or their definition of what I what they mean when they're throwing this word around is not consistent. So being a specialist in this space and a tech company that specializes in how do you define a skill taxonomy exactly and it's really not complicated for, for, but for some reason people have made it really <laughs> we've really made it really complicated <laughs> so for me and uh, for the company and for a lot of people a skill taxonomy is just a language to talk about skills essentially it's like a dictionary of skills and then a skill yeah. ontology uh, let's say adds relationships to it how does sales relate to marketing how does marketing yeah. Uh, relate to uh, to advertising. So there's a few relationships that exist. Hierarchies. Microsoft Azure is a, is a subset of of cloud computing skills uh, or adjacencies yeah. related uh, related programming languages. The problem is once you start like or once you try to to manually maintain a skills taxonomy, it's like like manually trying to maintain a Webster dictionary that is changing 25% year over year. So it doesn't work. And that's what we do. Yeah. It's like okay, you don't need a skill taxonomy to get started because we create one for you from the data you have. We map skills for people and then we create and cluster your taxonomy. Uh, and then like okay. manually trying to maintain it, I said it before, like it's changing so rapidly that it, there's just no point. It, it takes a lot of manual work and it essentially it decreases the leverage and the buy-in you have for a skills-based organization because okay. all people see is overhead, overhead, overhead.
Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that the, the simplicity of it actually makes it easier for folks. And I think to some degree, it's been made more complex to kind of create some confusion. So it sounds sounds really cool. Like, oh, you have a taxonomy. That sounds fancy type of a thing. But really, I mean, to me, the way I look at it is these skills are the things that people do. And the ontology you're talking about, it's like, well, how do we organize those? Because- exactly. And, exactly. and draw connections between them and say, well, these are related to these and these are kind of connected together. And it's really a lot more simple than we need it to be. And one of the things that I think you you bring up that actually ties to a comment Katie made that is that is challenging is that a lot of the tech out there are creating their own taxonomies and all of this, which actually makes it hard because then it's hard to integrate these systems. And I think that was one of the interesting things the first time we met that I said you were doing a bit differently was you're not necessarily tied to any specific platform. You're literally saying, no, I we come in and layer on top of that and say, what do you have? Let us pull that together and then actually look at, based on that, what taxonomy and ontology you have within your data. Exactly. And uh, Katie's remark is really valid because there's really no point in, in trying to have a monopoly on your, on your taxonomy because every customer we talk to, they want to have control over their skills. Like it, it makes sense. You want to have control over the skills yeah. you, let's say, you reward in your organization because it ties into so many things. Uh, so what we do is say, look, we'll do the heavy lifting of maintaining your taxonomy, but you have full control of, of how you want to maintain or update that taxonomy. We'll give you some updates. We see that people picked up new skills that are in the taxonomy. We can add it uh, to them. I think that's one of the, the key differentiators and the, the key things we care about is giving the customers control over their taxonomy without just having to well, uh, spend hours, days, weeks uh, main, uh, maintaining it. Because okay. we see it with every vendor right now, they're monopolizing their taxonomy. And it's not necessarily helping. It's trying to create a com competitive advantage, but it, it, it's it's a disadvantage for the user. And it's, the it's, to me, it's a short-term win for a long-term right. loss, both on the vendor and practitioner side. And it's a risk that I think organizations really need to consider carefully because the reality is if you get too bought into a single taxonomy that you don't own, that's too tied to a platform, it, it's, it's dangerous territory because now your whole taxonomy and ontology is tied to a specific platform versus this is what our skill this is what our skill ecosystem looks like and i think that's a really important thing that you have to be able to manage now on that topic i am curious on this and then i and then i'm going to shift gears to something else is with that whole component all right so we got these these skill taxonomies we've got all this stuff where do you stand on the yes there's nuance to your skills but how do you balance that with well you can't get too honed in on your individual organizational skills because that may not translate to the market or understanding you know what's going on broad so how do you find that right balance in the spectrum so that you don't get over indexed on well we've built this so custom just for us that it actually doesn't translate to anything in the industry while not going so broad based that it goes well now we're in the same situation where a software engineer at ford is the same as a software engineer at at Microsoft and we really, it's not really telling us anything meaningful. Exactly, what we see with our customers is that you have between 80 and 90% overlap in skills taxonomies. And obviously you're gonna have some okay. companies skills, but for, for some weird reason, people over index on the, the company specific skills. And they, they also think like, this is our taxonomy. It's not true. It's part of your taxonomy, okay. but it's not the entire thing. And you also said okay. something really interesting is it's like, tying the platform to the taxonomy. And that, that really profoundly doesn't make sense to us. Um, so that's why, essentially, we don't have a user interface. Uh, we are a backend interface. We, we, we solve the data problem. The skill data problem is a data problem. Uh, and as we discussed, people, they, they don't complete their skills profiles. They don't update it. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to, to add a specific user interface for it. And it also doesn't make sense for a platform to own that taxonomy. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, and I think it actually helps for, for folks out there who may be in this decision-making process for skills, actually owning your taxonomy as its own separate thing actually makes the technology purchasing process easier because you're able to say, this is what we, this is our skill ecosystem. How does that translate 
into the tech. And as you're making your decisions, you can see, well, how well does this translate in versus going the other way around and going, okay, what's the tech now? How would we make a, a skill ecosystem out of this? You're actually starting with the solution and working towards the problem instead of starting with the problem and saying, okay, now we're working towards a solution. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And I'm talking about problems. It's, it's, we, we see two types of organizations, organizations that say, look, we know skills are important. We want to focus on skills management. And, and they, they come to us and say like, okay, come in, do your API stuff, get a, get a skills data, get it, get it in our platform. That, that's the minority okay. of the market. Where the other side of the market is at the moment is they, they ha they're experiencing these problems. And what we see is that having skills data can actually solve those problems. Uh, yeah. for them. So th th those are the two things we see in the market. And I would love to, to hear your th thoughts on that as well. Like, what, what, what do you see happening uh, in the market on, on maturity, let's say, with respect, with respect to skills? Yeah. Uh, so in, the, in a lot of the conversations I've had, I would say probably more towards the latter, like you said, where people are not at the point where they're going, hey, we just need to wrap this up so that we can we can actually map this to where we need it to go in our systems because they haven't they haven't quite cracked the skills code. They really don't know what they have, what they need, how that measures against what's going on in the industry. Do, do we have what we need? Are we ready to go where we need to go? And to your point, I think, and this is the interesting part about it, is a lot of people are trying to solve these problems, thinking that solving the problems will get them to the skills taxonomy and ontology versus it's the other way around. You go get you You go do this part and a lot of these problems that are sitting in front of you, you go, well, now we have the information to, to solve them. We can easily solve this. We just need to figure out the how. But I would say that's almost going back to folks who may be listening. That's almost a reversal of mindsets. I think a lot of people are trying to get their systems, their tech, their processes in order first so they can get their skills taxonomies in order. And, and to me, it's like, no, actually reverse your order. But I think the challenge is there's not a lot of places you can go do that, which is why when even when we first started talking, I said, you're, you're in a unique position because not a lot of people are doing what you're doing, which is saying we can help you do that so you can solve your tech problems, your people problems, your organizational problems. There's not a lot of players that are actually helping folks do that. Exactly. And that's also what, we, what we've seen, like, especially in this year, you start noticing similarities uh, with your customers. So yeah. what we do when we come in, we have like this onboarding package where we do a data maturity scan, look at which data sources are actually good predictors of skills data, and we help them set up their skill text on me. And, and those are the two things you need to start yeah. being a skills organization. And then typically in six to eight weeks, we can give organizations, no matter the size, from the point we have the data, to an overview of individual skills. And, and people, they don't believe it, but... It no, because a lot of people are like, oh, to do this is going to be a year-long project and we're going to have to you know, no. do all this stuff. And it's like... Actually, no, it's not. Exactly, exactly. And then you get to the use case because, like, get, give it, getting the the initial overview, the skills inventory, as we call it, that's point one. And then solving an actual problem with that, like the the thing on performance management I man, mentioned, or let's say internal mobility. Uh, we had one customer that had to well uh, fire three thousand people in their do nothing scenario. With our skills yeah. data, they could redeploy two hundred people. That's 200 severance fees and 200 hiring fees that you save. That's a multi-million business case. And that's how yeah. people really start to realize, oh, wow, that's what we can do when we truly understand what our people are capable of. Well, and that gets to this. And, and I think some of this is, you know, there's an opportunity. I was reading the m most recent Udemy report on, on skills in terms of what they're seeing in terms of market trends. And one of the interesting things that I continue to see growing that I do think our industry might be lagging a bit behind. It's just behind is a lot of other functions are focused on data acumen, just understanding data and what can be done with data. And I think we're lagging a little bit in this, which is why we're struggling to see what you can do with this skills data and why getting this figured out and not the other way around. You know, again, the analogy that popped into my head is sometimes I feel like we're like, I'll go get flour and eggs after I bake a cake. And you go exactly. You don't you don't bake a cake until you have flour and eggs. Like, what do you you're doing this wrong? And I think that's the part that this skills acumen, the the data acumen of understanding how you can do this, how these sources work, how you can pull this together, and then how that is the critical ingredients to. 
the recipes that you're trying to solve for. Mm -hmm. But also, and that's like uh, after some reflection uh, uh, in the in the past months, like we came in with a very engineering AI mindset. Uh, we also yeah. have to talk your language. We also have to explain and educate people why this is this is a better way. Show them, give them examples, like what you can actually solve them because it's something new. Especially if you if you have a typical background in psychology, you you learn the things you learn. Uh, and yes. like this wasn't possible until like very very recently and we're really at the cutting edge here like think about it using teams data using a project management data to to predict someone's skills like intuitively you you maybe can can guess it's possible like let's say i see whatever you're doing whatever you're working on <laughs> it's easy, easy yeah to, 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 to guess your skills but it's it's like a mindset shift but once that mindset shift shift is uh is made like some some really nice things happen but uh, it, it goes both ways. We also like uh, worked a bit on our messaging. We uh, we made sure that we we took our time to to educate the market, to educate people on on why this this is a better way. But on the other hand, like data acumen, I think like ten years from now, uh, it it will be a necessity. It uh, will help. Maybe, maybe even uh, it, it, I I think it will. But I I think to the to that point of the messaging, and I will say that's that's a journey I've been on in my career because my background's been very technical. And so going into L&D, there were a lot of things where I'd look at and go, I mean, isn't this really obvious? Like, don't, isn't this really apparent to everyone? And it wasn't. And that storytelling of, okay, how do we translate this into HR language? How do we translate this into business cases for operations leaders? Because many of them don't have that kind of data acumen because it didn't, they didn't need it before. And so when they're told, hey, if we do, if we build a skills taxonomy and ontology by pulling data from teams and other desperate technology sources, we can actually solve your business problems. Eyes go blank, flies over their head, and they're like, that I don't. I think we're good. Can't we send out a survey and just ask people what they're good at? And, and you're like, I, okay, yeah. hang on. Let's let's <laughs> but. I think that's it's it's a fair amount um, to consider, but it is much easier than than people think. And I think Katie Katie chimed in again. You know, it's not as crazy to do, but there is still a degree of work that goes into it. And I think even with some of the things you're saying, Katie, I, I think it's easier than we realize. Yes, there's work to be done, but I think what we're talking about here is the fact that a lot of this can be automated. And a lot of this can be done because a lot of that manual work and unwinding some of this stuff really can be done with tech. Is that fair? I mean, that's that's really where you specialize is how do we actually use tech to accelerate and automate some of these things that are a lot of work, but they don't have to be a lot of work for us. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's, it's exactly what we do. And uh, to, to Katie's point, it's, again, people almost immediately associate manual work and a lot of manual work uh, with this. But then we come in and show, and show them like, this is the amount of manual work you, know, you can actually save. You don't have to manually maintain your taxonomy. And of course, there's going to be some manual work. It's not going to be like this and, and you have yeah, skills. Yeah, it's not like that. Like work, actually. But it's just a lot easier. And I think that's with, with many great technologies, they just make your life easier. Uh, and that's what we what we aim to do. Okay. Well, and I think, and I think the point with that is, and to me, this is where my success, I found success in this is the work that I end up investing in when you make the right decisions on this is in the storytelling, is in the building influence, is in helping people understand what you're going to be able to do. It's that people side. And, and that's exactly what Katie chimed in on is the fact that yes, that people side is where the effort goes, helping people understand the value of this, helping understand what we're going to do with this. But it's not, I think sometimes when people think about skills taxonomies, they think of, oh gosh, we're going to have to run a survey and then analyze the survey results. We're going to have to pull all these inputs and, and do all that. And a lot of that is now completely automated. Mm -hmm. And we have, we have customers, I think uh, uh, David Spurl at, at GE Healthcare is, is one of the leading examples there. Like, they are at the beginning of their skills journey and they know that. And that's perfectly fine. They know that it's, especially for a large organization, more than 50,000 people, they know that it isn't going to be solved in day one but they're gradually building uh well buy-in for the skill-based organization in the organization we have the same with yeah. a global energy company we started with skill-based workforce planning essentially they're making a big transition from uh, well typically oil and energy to renewables the workforce planning question is how do we make this transition without firing twenty thousand people and hiring 20 more 
Then after showing the first, first results, we had a call with six VPs, uh, all super interested in the skills piece because we could actually show like, look, this is what we did. This is how much time it took us. And this is where this impacts all your respective areas. So, yeah, yeah. Well, and I think on that end, I think what we don't realize is we are capturing a lot more, especially with all the digital tech that now we have in organizations, we're actually capturing a lot more information than we may even realize. And so while we may think, oh, well, we'll, we'll get there once we figure this out, you probably have more than you realize to be able to at least pull, pull some of this. So that transitions me to this piece, which is, okay, it's one thing. And I think this is, this is another mindset shift or, or not even necessarily shift, but maturity shift that we can make is right now. I just see as an industry, we, we tend to put a lot of emphasis on getting the skill data, right. Or the skill taxonomy, right. And that's, that's a foundation, but it's not, that's not the destination. The destination isn't to go, Hey, great. Look at this. We have all this, we have this really cool skills taxonomy now and, and look how we've connected everything and we've changed our job descriptions to, to match. This is wonderful. It's really about saying, well, what, what actionable inferences can we take and what actions can we take off of this? So I'm curious one, are you seeing, are you seeing, cause you're talking to a lot of people about this. Are they making that shift? Does that come pretty naturally once they see this come together and they go, whoa, do the wheels just start turning or is there almost some effort that has to be done? And do people have to have some use cases coming into it or does the data naturally just create them? On your first question, like you need to be a skill-based organization and it doesn't have, just have, doesn't have to be like a skill-based corner. Uh, in, yeah. in, in the <laughs> uh, well, yeah. it's it, like we, we had one, one, one customer and he, he was an early believer he 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 really was the well the the number one cheerleader uh, of TechWolf in, in his organization uh, and outside of it. But the organization they weren't ready to make that shift. They they are now, but it really took them a while. On the use cases question, uh, maybe just to to add to to my previous point. So there's going to be some change. Well, let me especially. before you go to that, Caleb. Before you go to that, I want to ask on that one. Okay, so this organization because I agree with you, and I think this ties to Katie's point of. The people side, it's not even just the people, the end users, it's its getting the organization and leadership to think of themselves as a skill-based organization. Have there been any things that you've seen that have helped people make that shift and go, uh, oh, okay, now I get it? Or is it is it a timing thing? Is it a, we've just hit the, hit the floor and then we fell through the floor and hit another floor underneath it and we realized like, uh-oh, the only way we're crawling out of this? I mean, what is it that actually forces that shift? What really helps for us is just time to results. Like, look, we come in, okay. we get your skills data, and we, we solve that use case or that problem. We had one uh, one cu customer, like uh, I think a little under 10,000 people. And at some point, we had the CEO, the CTO, and the CIO all in a meeting uh, arguing about skills. And it was like, it was amazing to just <laughs> sit back and relax. And like, and suddenly it just clicked. Like, th they were thinking in skills. And that's, that's, we, we, Essentially, in that meeting, we created buy-in okay. at the top for the skill-based organization because you, you solve you solve the problem for the CEO. Well, if you if you solve a problem for the CEO, it typically is a little bit easier to. It doesn't uh, take very long. It doesn't take very long for things to pick up if you solve a problem at that level. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then on the use cases coming in, like we used to be a, even a little bit cocky, it's like yeah, just pick a use case, just just uh, pick a use case and get started with this. Like a, a few years into this, we 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 noticed that just showing people like these are a few use cases in let's say talent these are a few use cases in learning these are a few use cases in, in workforce strategy that we see here's the menu this typically works in your industry for your company size it works a lot better because also like why, why is amazon amazon uh, so amazing they make it really easy for you to get started with them to buy things like sometimes we made it really complex for organizations to get started uh, to get started with us so there might be some use cases ready, but th there you have to differentiate between solving a problem for an individual and solving a problem for the organization. And especially with skills, it, it gets tricky. So that's what we do now. We, we, we have a bunch of use cases. We typically see like in a specific industry, uh, it's going to be either, especially today, transformation, reskilling, upskilling related in organization with, with high turnover, it's going to be focused on retention, uh, making sure the organization is the be best place to work, uh, to grow and to develop. 
and to drive internal mobility, essentially, especially now with the great resignation or in workforce strategy. So typically it's like a, a little bit of a positive reinforcement loop once we uh, start talking, but we come in and, and just show them like, this is what we can do with skills. Uh, and then we pick one that will have the, the biggest impact. Okay. You know, what, what's interesting about this is uh, on this topic, because to me, this is one of those, there's a handful of things over my career when I've gone, believe me, you make a bet on this, you're not going to lose the bet. <laughs> there's not a lot of things that I would just place my chips on and go, trust me, you make this bet, you're going to double your money and you're going to be able to reinvest. It's not, it's not really a question of of whether you will, it's a matter of what the dividend on your return is going to be. This happens to be one of them because even, even a recent industry report I was looking at, I think it was only, it's less than half of companies globally that were surveyed have any confidence in what they know about the skills of their workforce. Yet it is almost their number one priority in terms of this is a problem. So there's not a lot of organizations out there left that are going, this skills thing's a trend. I don't, we don't need to worry about it. And you know, we've already got it figured out. I, I really can say, I don't think I've run across a single organization in the last five years that has said, nah, we're good. We're good. I'm not worried about it. There's not a senior executive in this company that has any concerns because we've solved it. But I think sometimes it's telling that story and not even telling the story. I think sometimes we can talk too much because I had one conversation where I was talking to a board about this and I just asked that question. I said, how much do you know about the skills of your workforce? And you could just see the, you know, some people tried to posture and pretend like, oh no, we, we, we know what's going on here. But just asking some simple questions. People. Yeah. No, I know my people. Exactly. Like I know my people and they, they, I know what they need to do. But, but you, you ask the question like, how, how are you doing that now? And oh, the walls kind of come down and how confident in that are you? Like, how would you be willing to make a hiring decision or would you be able to make, be willing to make a restructure with full confidence on the data you have? Any sort of posturing melts really quickly. And when you can get to that point, being able to say, but we can do something about that. That mm -hmm. is a really compelling story that can change the mindsets. Because I, I would say, even if they're not using the right terminology, I would say most orgs recognize skills is a thing that's a problem for us, which is why it's showing up on not just HR reports. I mean, it's showing up on every industry report that's out there that there's a skill crisis we aren't sure what to do about it, and we don't have visibility into it. Exactly. And Deloitte had this, has these two really nice articles uh, on the skill-based organization. And one of the, the key things they, they start with is really just saying, like, today, the talent shortage is one of the key things that, that's hindering business growth. So anything you can do to make sure that your people stay and that's ma making sure that they are engaged, making sure that they can grow, that they can develop themselves. Like that, the business case is there. Uh, people that are engaged in the work, people that can work on their strengths, they're twice as productive. So they are a lot more likely uh, to stay. Same with growing people and developing people. So just from an individual perspective, knowing the skills of your people, as a manager, it helps you to assign them to projects uh, that, that fit their strengths, that fit, fit their talents. As a regulation, you're, you're sure that they, they'll stay or you have like at least some confidence or some more confidence that they'll stay with the organization and they don't leave uh, without the or without the built up knowledge. So, yeah, I can uh, I think we're, we're both convinced. Right. So, uh... yeah. yeah, you don't I don't think you have to convince yeah, either of us. Like I said, true. if I had to bet if I had to bet the house, I would bet the house on this just because this is crushing organizations right now. I, I had another report I just saw this week talking about, you know, how difficult. This is especially in front lines right now. You want to talk about, you know, 80% of the workforce is frontline work work workers. And there's really one of the big myths that I think has been revealed is I think there was just this underlying assumption that that kind of got destroyed, which was, ah, you know, we can fill that. Not that's not really ever an issue for us. And all of a sudden, now it's an issue, and a huge part of the workforce. It's competitive. It's hard to find people. It's hard to figure out 
well, who are the right people that will stick and stay and succeed because the turnover is is just crushing them and they're having a hard time with it. So my that that kind of turns me to this point is when when you work with folks on this, how does this you, you explain the process a little bit, but then how does this translate from okay, maybe we've got some high level visibility into what's going on. How are organizations taking that high level boardroom visibility and actually then running that down the chain to say, okay, and here's now how we're going to mobilize our talent, or here's how we're going to change our talent acquisition or talent retention strategy into more tangible terms. Because I think that's one of the things that some folks might be missing the connection still is, okay, I get like at a high level, we might get this, but then what does that, how does that actually help on the day-to-day -day basis? And how are you seeing that translate? Yeah. So you you're right. And you have the business level, then you have the, the manager slash HR uh, or HRVP level, and then you have the employee level. And it really happens on, on three levels. So the business level, it's the, the, the high level insights. You can highlight yeah. some problems. You, you can get that transparency. On a manager or an HR level, we, we typically come in with just uh, dashboards, interfaces that, that show them like, look, um, let's say you want to hire a few, a, few, uh, a few dozen data scientists. Okay. Yeah. Where, are, where could they potentially be in your organization? Like they're not going to be called data scientists, but their skills might lead us to believe that they're very adjacent to the skills uh, of, uh, of a data scientist. Um, another example uh, is the one on performance management uh, I just uh, I just mentioned. So oh, yeah. The, the organization, like, <laughs> uh, it's actually funny, and you, you, you already alluded to it, uh, but it really stemmed from the CHRO having a discussion with her minus one. Essentially, it was it went something along, along these lines, like, Chris, I only think your uh, instructional design level skills uh, skills level is three, and, and and you say to me, no, I think it's four, uh, and then <laughs> what what do you do? <laughs> right, what do we're just arg we're arguing hypotheticals here. Well, I think exactly. it's four. You think it's three. How do we have this? And everybody should be able to relate to this right now because if you're like any organization on the planet, you're probably going through performance and talent calibrations at this time of year. So these conversations are probably relatively fresh. Exactly. You, you can still feel it. You can still remember the discussion. And <laughs> what they, want, they, kind of, they kind of turned it around because they had a, a skills management uh, process. They spent a lot of time and effort in it. They had, I think they had 19 skills uh, on average. And what we found was when looking at the data, so we predicted skills for them apart from the 19 skills they had. And we looked at evidence for skills uh, that we could find in their data sources. And we only found strong evidence for six skills. Uh, we had no evidence for three skills. But that, that shifts the entire conversation uh, because you can just okay. talk about the data. Uh, you can see, and there, that's where team da Teams data comes in. Like, look, I see that you think that you're a even five on instructional design, but you're not using these skills. Like, I'm yeah. pretty sure you're not a five. Uh, and people are also not coming to you um, with their questions on the instructional design. Said, they're coming to uh, th this person and that person only rated themselves a four. So that's one of these, these, key, uh, these key use cases. Um, that, that we see on that level. Same with the, the ROI on, on learning. So for a salesperson, like the, the, the effect of a negotiation training it can be seen directly in, in closed revenue sold deals. And that's also like- Oh yeah, no, I'm amazing at influence and negotiations. Well, according to our skills data and your close rates and your Salesforce data and all this customer interactions, I would say you're not a five. Exactly, exactly. But and then you start thinking like, okay, a developer creating better software will also generate uh, more revenue. So essentially, yeah. that's what, what the organization is thinking about. How can we use skills as a language to also objectify uh, performance and also me measure the ROI of learning? How can we, uh, let's say, uh, link skills to a market premium and also see how much a, a course costs uh, and then see if, if an investment in a course uh, makes uh, makes sense or not uh, makes sense or yeah. not. Okay. So well, and I think that's actually really interesting. So there's two things I want to follow on to that because it, I, I, I'm telling we probably could talk about this till four in the morning. But um, you know, even <laughs> even I, I guess for learning leaders who might be listening to this, the ability to justify investments in development for people can be taken from this because in your example, if we know objectively, not subjectively based on who knows what, that the organization is actually here. And we need to get them here. And if we invest X number of dollars 
and that's and that gets this and that's going to net this kind of return that makes the business justification for hey these investment dollars in development are actually going to save us money not cost us money and i know it looks like a dollar line on the balance sheet but in the long term and now you can have that be a business finance discussion with your cfo and instead of it being like yeah here's the learning people coming telling us they want more dollars for training and they can't really justify the why, we actually can quantifiably justify the investment. Exactly. One of our customers is looking at evolution of skills. So we actually timestamp your skill profiles. I'll, I won't get into the details, but essentially it enables us to, to essentially graph the evolution of skills over time. But mm. that makes it a lot easier to yeah, uh, measure the ROI of learning because you can see like, okay, at this point in time, we had the training, like are these skills actually being picked up in the organization? Right. Do we actually Did we improve on the things that we said exactly. we were planning on improving on? Exactly. Yeah. Well, and the, the other one too, that just made me kind of chuckle when I think of this performance management. Okay. Cause I mean, again, some of the comments are kind of funny on this, but um, you know, I mean, it's a frustrating time of year. Again, the subjectivity of arguing over performance calibrations. Well, I think this person's a three and I think they're a four and and this person over here thinks they're a, a one. And you're trying to figure out how do we actually calibrate? But that actually ties to dollars and cents. And I think sometimes we forget that is that that is a financial, that has major financial implications on, on an organization. I think sometimes people don't always think about it at the 100,000 foot level, at the board level. But, you know, because we may say, well, 2% raise, that's not very much. Well, the difference between two and three and a half percent of calibration ratings across the organization, that can be tens of millions of dollars a year in, in cost that you're putting into an organization where you may, be, you may be saying, we're investing all this money in people that may not actually be where they need to be. And I mean, it's it's actually there's a financial return on getting performance management right. It's not just a like, well, it's something we got to do, and yeah, the arguments are awkward. Mm -hmm, exactly, and if you, that's that's also a reflection we made. Like, how how do we li link skills to business value? And their performance management and an ROI of learning, ROI of HR initiatives, like those are the top two because performance is business performance in a, in a way. So that's also one yeah. of our key use cases we we see like helping you objectify the performance management cycle. That, that is a use case. We actually I had another customer that, where this came from the CEO. So uh, CEO said like, look, to the CTO, I want you to fix performance management first. Uh, and there we could like, we, we went in and showed like, look, this is what a customer is doing uh, when thinking about objectifying performance management. And essentially she was ecstatic because that was what she was looking for. The, the, she was thinking about, okay, uh, do we start assessing people? Do we start serving people? And she really felt a lot of internal friction with all these initiatives because she deep down she knew like this we tried this we, we the skill management promise like it's great but it hasn't really been fulfilled so there was a lot of internal friction so i think for, for me personally the, the performance management one is a, is a really really interesting one especially uh, well and and when not only is it timely but i mean this really is i mean i just even think of some conversations i've had with organizations recently who are trying to crack the performance management thing not only because they're trying to deal with retention, but they're trying to deal with hiring. They're trying to manage, you know, funds and, and all of this stuff. And I think there's an interesting trend that I saw several years ago that now seems to be swinging back. But to me, it seems like it was an effort to solve this, that this problem could have solved for in the first place. And this was the argument of the performance review, right? How frequently is it? And, and for a while it was, oh, we do it this way. And then there was the trend of, hey, we're cool. We're throwing out the performance reviews. We're not going to do this anymore. And they dumped it. They threw the baby out with the bathwater. And then any limited insight we had into performance vanished. I mean, just vaporized because like, oh, shoot. <laughs> now nobody's having conversations. We're not rating, like even though they were subjective before, now we're not doing it at all. Now we've got nothing. Now the pendulum's kind of swinging back and I'm seeing an over-indexing of, oh, you know what we need to do? We need to have pulse conversations and these need to be monthly and quarterly and we need to do talent caliber. And it's like, you're, you're putting in a lot of work into something that could be objectively analyzed and, and actually reduce work, make it easier, make it better for workers, make it better for managers, have actual performance discussions, reduce cost, and actually improve business performance. Exactly. And on that, like we, we had, one of our advisors is the, the former CTO of a, of a big bank. And 
we're like at some point like oh wow he also he was a CTO so maybe he could like bring in some actual HR practices and we were talking about feedback so regular feedback and then the more formalized performance review and said so, guys you just need both you're probably doing the re the regular feedback uh just talking to your people uh having those pulse check-ins as you say but just in the one-on-ones but you also need the formalized moments where you actually sit down look at the data look at performance and talk about what happens essentially a summary of achievements or whatever you want to call it but you, you need both um the problem is like if you're trying to condense one year of information in one conversation and you have good old recency <laughs> bias well th that's not working so that's where data really really, really yeah. comes in and uh and it's helping a lot of uh, organizations well and and i know we're spinning on this one a lot but this is a major hr problem because it has it has tentacles into a lot of the things HR leaders are trying to solve for right now, whether it's retention, whether it's hiring, whether it's, I mean, all these things. And one of the things, again, this is a trend where I think we, we're we trying to solve the problem, but sometimes we're trying to solve it the hard way versus there's an easier way to do it. And one of those is, you know, well, we need more manager conversations. We need managers to be engaging with their people. And if we tell them to have more or we force the system to make them do it more, then that's going to help. And one of the things that's been interesting about it is when I talk to frontline managers, when I talk to managers, one of the reasons these things don't really happen very much is there's not a lot of confidence with a manager to know how to have that discussion or how to make it objective. They don't really know what to talk with their person about in terms of performance or skills gaps or things they can be working on because even they feel like, well, I mean, I think this, but like they say it's not, and I don't really have anything to go off of. And they're, they're telling me people love them. And I don't want to be the one to go. Yeah, I know, but I don't think you're quite where we need you. And so it's contributing to why they're not having the conversations. And so we think, well, if we just have them, it'll happen. And it's like, no, we need to equip them with the information and not, naturally it will just happen. There's still work to be done, but equipping them with the right information makes it that much easier for them to say, well, now I feel comfortable having a discussion because I have information to share that isn't my personal opinion based on my interaction with you. Exactly. And like skills on the employee and manager level, it, it just equals transparency. Um, it helps the manager have yeah. a conversation. If you manage people, like imagine knowing like, from all your direct reports, what they could do, and then also where they wanted to grow towards. Then, then you can have a database yep. conversation. Like, you're here, you need to be there. Right. Let's sit down together and figure this out. I, I used to be in your shoes. Like, what, what are the steps you can take? So, like, in my in my opinion, skills data is really going to revolutionize HR as a practice, but also on the manager level, it's going to make it a lot easier. And on the business, it's also going to have a tremendous impact. So. Uh, you're right. We could probably sit down and talk about this for, uh, <laughs> for six more hours, but uh, yeah. But 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 again, I, and I think this is a, a natural place to to kind of wrap because this has really what I liked about where we landed was I, I think we really unpacked a very practical, tangible use case for people in our industry who may be like, okay, I, I kind of get it, but like, how would this really translate? Because this does. We just described those three tiers. We showed how it, yes, it affects the board level conversation. Yes, it affects at the corporate COE kind of HR level, but it also ties back to that frontline manager. How does it change the way they have conversations with their people? It just makes it easier. Instead of saying, well, I gave you a three this year and that ties to this merit and they go, well, I, I don't agree with that. And you're going, uh, okay. You can say, but here's here's why, and here's the data, and here's what we're going to do about it, because I don't want you to be there, and clearly you don't want to be there. So now we can create a development plan, and now exactly. we have grounds to justify learning and development dollars to build something for it. Exactly. So okay. I, uh, I look forward to, uh, to continue our, our, our conversation <laughs> next year. Uh, I know. Well, we'll see you again. We'll see you again next year. And well, again, this has been uh, hopefully for those of you who have watched and it's it, I love the comments that have come in. But hopefully this is helped shift some of those mindsets and folks who listen to this after or down the road. You know, if you're in this place, you're not alone. I will tell you that right now. You are not alone in this space at all. And, and I think you would validate that as well, that this isn't like 90 percent of organizations are.
have arrived and it's it's the few that are left is that fair yeah it's 100 percent fair it's in the okay. well only thing that's uh, left for me to say if, if any organization or any individual is really working on this topic shoot me a message on linkedin or, or shoot me an email it's uh, mikhail at techwolf.ai and we can have that conversation and uh, make you a skill-based organization all right all right well thank you for the time enjoy the rest of your time in the beautiful I weather will. there i, I will. won't keep you till four in the morning. i know i can see it it looks gorgeous so go out to the pool have a have a adult beverage on friday night for me and uh we will talk to you again thanks for being here bye-bye chris